You're going to be opening up your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, we will be there in just a moment. Again, want to extend everybody a welcome, uh, especially since it is a uh, Super Sunday. We are going to be having our meal following our service this morning, and we do hope you plan to, to stay here for the meal and then for the uh, presentation that we're going to have from our security team following our meal. Uh, I know that will be informative and uh, beneficial for us. Make plans to be here and stay here. I'm sure we have plenty of food, and uh, whether you brought something or not this morning, uh, we want you to stay and to take part and uh, so we can fellowship uh, with one another. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we have been going through the Gospel of Mark, or as we've titled this series, The Good News According to Mark, because that's what the word gospel means. The word gospel means good news. Uh, and we believe that the words that are within the book of Mark is, are indeed good news. It brings us good news because it tells us the story of who Jesus is, what Jesus did, uh, and how Jesus saves us. Uh, and we believe that is wonderful and great and good news. Uh, so, so through this series, we're going through the entire book of Mark. If you are here for each sermon or if you are able to tune in online for the weeks that you miss, uh, if, if you are here for the duration, then uh, you will have read the entire book of Mark by the time we get through the end of this series. And uh, we are excited to be going through uh, the gospel here at Mark. We are still toward the beginning of Jesus' ministry here in Mark chapter 4. Uh, last week in Mark chapter 3, we saw where Jesus... Um, designated his apostles. He took the disciples that he had, he, he, he got 12 of those that were general disciples, and he designated 12 uh, to be called apostles. And we see Jesus' ministry really start to take shape uh, here. And previously, what we've seen a lot of Jesus doing is uh, healing, healing the sick and performing miracles and casting out demons mostly centered around synagogues, which was the Jewish place of worship or the Jewish gathering space. And it was mostly around synagogues. And what we're now going to see is Jesus transition to being a little more mobile. And he's going to start preaching and presenting lessons in different places and performing miracles in different places. And the first, uh, se- uh, the, the, the first story really that we get uh, from Jesus in this new attack on ministry uh, is Jesus' parable of the sower, the parable of the sower. And, and in just a moment, Marshall's going to come and, and read for us the parable of the sower. And uh, the parable of the sower, it's also called the parable of the soils. And, and in this parable, Jesus uh, gives uh, a, a, a parable, which is a story about four different types of soils, uh, which reflect the human heart and how different people respond differently to the gospel. Um, and I'll be honest with you, when I was preparing for this, or, or before, I, when, I, when I knew this was coming up, I was dreading it a little bit, because for some reason, this particular parable and me have not connected in, in, in ways where I feel like, man, I really am excited about teaching this. It's, not, it's, it's always something that I've been a little bit confused by. And, uh, it, and the more I've studied it the, the last uh, week and, and been preparing to present to you something, the more I've learned about this and, and the more I've grown in my understanding of it. And I know that's probably just a glimpse into what hopefully my entire future will be with the gospel. And, and all of us are on a journey of learning the gospel and, and learning that together. But the parable of the sower is one that causes some questions and is one that, that people are often confused by. And in fact, as we'll read in the story, Jesus presents this parable, and even his closest followers, his, his apostles and his disciples, they come up to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, what was up with that parable? And he explains it. Now, the word parable is, is uh, a, a word that's used to explain the style of teaching that Jesus uses. And, and the most common definition that we see for the word parable, uh, or, or that's used for the word parable, is that a parable is an earthly story with a, you probably know maybe, a heavenly meaning. That, that's, that's kind of the age-old definition of what a parable is. And Jesus would use parables. He would use these earthly stories and within these earthly stories that have to do with very earthly things, there would be a nugget of the kingdom of God. And if you were someone who had a little bit of insight into God and into the kingdom of God, you would understand these earthly stories in a different way than a lot of people would. Uh, so, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Uh, Jesus uses this parable of the sower. Marshall, go ahead and come on up here. Marshall's going to read for us 
Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 9. And Jesus is essentially going to tell this parable twice. The first time he tells it, which is what Marshall is going to read for us, is Jesus is telling to the masses. He tells this to a huge crowd of, of people. Um, and then the second time that Jesus tells the parable, he tells it to his disciples and his apostles, and he is further explaining the meaning behind what he told the masses. So Mar Marshall, go ahead and read for us Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 9. <clears throat> Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came down and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and it immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when, it, but when the sun came up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew and choked it, and yielded no crop. But the other seed fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Thank you, Marshall. Jesus ends the parable with this phrase. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if you're someone who reads Scripture, you know Jesus says this a couple times. And basically, anytime Jesus says this, what he is alluding to is he has a difficult teaching. And that a lot of people maybe will have the teaching come into the ears, but they will not understand it. It's sort of like a mother saying to a child, giving their child an instruction, and the child does not follow the instruction, so the mother follows up with... Did you hear me? I, I don't know. For, for me, when I was growing up, it was probably involved video games, and I'd be playing video games, and my mom would tell me, Justin, I would like for you to go take out the trash. And I say, okay, mom, and I keep playing my video game, and she says, did you hear me? And what she means is not, not did the audio come into my ears, but, but did I hear her in that? Did I understand what she needed, and am I going to respond accordingly to what she has told me? Did you hear me? And that's sort of what Jesus is saying here. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who is able to hear and to understand and to respond accordingly, let him hear. In fact, the Hebrew word here is shema. And uh, all the way in the, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, Moses has this incredible speech that he gives to the nation of Israel, and it starts out, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one And that very first word, hear, O Israel, that very, very first word, hear, is the word Shema. And what that means is not just to hear, but it means to hear, understand, and respond accordingly. Uh, or as some rabbis say, to hear is to obey. And that's similar to what Jesus is saying here when he says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, he, he who is able to understand this teaching and respond accordingly, let them do so. He's saying this is, a, this is difficult, but it is important. So, like I admitted earlier, I, I had some difficulty with this passage probably in, in my past, and uh, not to a degree where I disagreed with it, not to a degree where I didn't fully understand the concepts, uh, just where I didn't have the comfort level to probably teach it in the ways that I necessarily wanted to teach it. And Jesus kind of points to that, where he says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is saying, this is a difficult teaching. Not everyone is going to understand it. Uh, in, in fact, if you go down to verse 10, in verse 10, the story continues after Jesus speaks to the masses. Verse 10, it says, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has, has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. Jesus is saying that some will hear, hear parables, and some will be able to understand the secret of the kingdom of God that's revealed to them in the parables. Some of them will not get past the earthly story. Some of them, they will just be parables. And when you read this, this is probably where some of the difficulty came for me in the past. You read this and you think, well, that doesn't quite seem fair that some people will hear these stories and make a an heavenly connection, and some people will hear these stories and they will just be stories, and they won't be able to make the heavenly connection. And Jesus even doubles down on this in verse 12. 
And in verse 12, he says, So that, and then he's quoting from Isaiah, but, but notice the thought behind it. So that they may indeed see but not perceive, and they indeed may hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Jesus quotes a passage from Isaiah where God is exacting judgment unto the Israelites because they were not obeying his word. And God is basically saying through Isaiah that the people are seeing, but they are not perceiving, that the people are hearing, but they are not understanding, and that might even be good so because then they would have to turn and be forgiven. So you read this passage, and there can be uh, a thought of, is Jesus saying that he wants some people to understand this in one way, and he wants other people to understand this in a different way? And the answer is no. But Jesus is speaking to the reality that he is going to speak something, and some people will understand it one way, and some people will understand it a different way that there will be different responses to the things that he was saying and the things that he's teaching, and some of those responses will not be ideal. Jesus says in verse 13, And he said to them, Do you understand this parable? So again, Jesus has told this parable about the soil that Marshall read. The disciples, the apostles, they come to Jesus and they say, What's the deal with these parables, Jesus? Can you explain them to us? And, and in verse 13, Jesus says, And he said to them, Do you understand this parable? Or, sorry, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? Jesus is elevating this parable, seemingly, and he's saying if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any parable. You have to understand this parable to understand all parables. That's seemingly what it says. I think there's a little bit of a different hidden meaning here. Go back to verse 11. They inquire about the they inquire about the parable and Jesus says, "To you has been given the secret of the of the kingdom of God." Okay? So Jesus inquires, "Hey, there is a secret and that has been given to you." So the question is, is how how did they get the secret? How do we get the secret? If there's a secret to the kingdom of God, I want to know what that secret is. If there's a secret to understanding these parables, I want to know what is the secret to understanding the parables. What is the secret to understanding the kingdom of God? I think that's what everybody wants to know. If there is a God, I want to know what's the secret in understanding him. What's the secret in understanding his teachings? And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? And you know what he does next? He explains it to them. Jesus explains to them the parable. How is it that we understand all parables? Through Jesus. Through Jesus explaining the parables. How is it that we understand God? Through Jesus. We understand God to the level that we can understand God because Jesus was God on earth. So our ability to understand the secret of the kingdom of heaven, our ability to understand these earthly stories with heavenly meanings is rooted in our understanding of Jesus and our level of intellect to the things that Jesus taught, or our, our level of insight into the things that Jesus taught. How was it that the disciples and the apostles had the secret? They had the secret to the kingdom of, of heaven that Jesus was alluding to here because they inquired about it. Because they heard the mass teaching and they stayed with it and they stayed with Jesus to hear more of the teaching. If we want to be people who are, in, who are insiders, if we want to be people who, who know about the secret of the kingdom of heaven, who understand the nature of God, it is rooted in our understanding of the teachings of Jesus and us letting those teachings be things that we have ears to hear that we let the teachings of Jesus be things that we understand and that we respond accordingly to the things that we understand that he says. Okay, so how, how we understand all parables? Only through Jesus. We have to keep inquiring, and we trust that Jesus transforms. That's what Jesus does. Jesus transforms. Jesus changes the way that we think and the way that we understand the world. It's only through Jesus that we can understand the world and be transformed and think about, about the world in the way that he would have us to think. The very next verse, verse 14. So Jesus tells this, this parable, what Marshall read, verses 3 through 9. And if you only read that 
section of the parable, verses 3 through 9, we can make all sorts of reaches about what the parable means. And to one of us, the parable would mean one thing, and to another person, the parable would mean another thing. You know, to, to the farmer who hears only what was read through verses 3 through 9 about the sower spreading the seed without there being more information given, the farmer might would think, well, that, that was foolish of the farmer, of the sower, to sow on the path and to sow in the rocks. We need to be more careful about where it is that we spread uh, the seed. We need to be more particular about what it is that we spend our time with and, and spend our time doing, and that's not the point of the parable at all. But Jesus really, through one line, reshapes the understanding. Jesus, through one line, gives a hint into what the parable is really about. And the first thing that he says to his apostles, the sower sows the word. And he lets us know that the seed is, is the word of God. And if Jesus didn't go into further uh, information about the parable from this one sentence, probably we could still draw out what Jesus meant through this parable. It's through this one line that Jesus really transformed what the parable was about. Uh, the sower sows the word. Jesus explains the parable. And again, the whole point is, if we want to be people who have ears that truly hear, who understand the word of God, we have to be people who continually inquire and go before Jesus and let him transform us. Um, and while, there's, while there are probably multiple meanings of what we could get out of this parable of the four soils, um, there's really only, only one point that really is worth investigating this morning. And that point is, uh, what type of soil are you? We get in a lot of discussion on, on the way that the sower sows the word and the, uh, the role that a sower has and the best practices that a sower has to sow the word. And we can, we can talk about it. And I think part of what Jesus was using this parable for was to encourage his disciples and apostles that, hey, you are going to be people who spread the word. And as you're spreading the word, people are going to reject you and people are going to turn away from you and people are going to judge you and you're going to have success sometimes and that success is going to crumble before you. Part of Jesus telling this parable, I think, was instructing the apostles, apostles of what to expect as they're spreading the word of God, but ultimately, uh, the the point of the of the parable is: what type of soil are you? That's the question that we, all of us first must answer. What type of soil are you? So let's read together. We're going to read Jesus explaining the four different types of soil in this passage, and and as we as we go through uh, these four different types of soil, uh, if you're not familiar with the story. The first three types of soil are all people who reject the gospel. They're all people who, one way or the other, reject the good news of who Jesus is. The fourth soil is called the good soil, uh, and that's people who are ready to accept the gospel message. And instantly when we go through this, we are viewing this with eternity eyes, as in we are viewing this as uh, people who are saved, and people who are not saved. People who are able to receive the word of God in a way that transforms them towards salvation and people who reject the word of God in a way that uh, separates them further from God. But there is a principle that I think you can apply for yourself in a daily way as well, not just through the eternal sense, but through a daily way. Um, and as we go through these soils, you can ask yourself, day to day, am I a person who... Uh, lives to this type of soil or this type of soil. And I won't be giving points for that throughout the lesson, but if you take this lesson home with you and you think about it, there is a daily sense where you can look at this soil as well. All right, let's get to Jesus explaining the passage. Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, he says the sower uh, is sowing the word. And then he goes on to the different types of soil. And the first soil that we see is the soil that Jesus calls the path. Uh, and in verse 15, he says, And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes them away uh, and takes the word that is sown in them. Uh, so the first, the first soil that we see is a pathway. 
uh, and, and that pathway is, is the, the soil that is right next to the road, and the soil that's right next to the road is, is a type of soil that you are simply not going to be able uh, to have seed make contact with the dirt. Um, and it's going to be making contact with more of a pathway, and the seed can't enter into the ground and ever germinate. So the seed is instantly rejected. The seed is instantly just going to be laying on the surface, and any seed that's laying on the surface is going to be attacked and eaten by birds. So Jesus says that's, that's how some people are going to receive the Word of God. Some people, they are going to instantly reject the Word of God. There is something within them that makes it to where they are seemingly impervious to the word, that the word bounces off of them, that they are going to instantly reject anybody that comes to them uh, to bring God's word. Uh, they instantly reject, reject the word of God due to their hardness of heart. There's a lot of reason people might be, uh, people might have a hard heart when it comes to the word of God. Ultimately, what this means is that they are repulsed by the word of God, that when it comes toward them, they instantly reject it. Oftentimes, this repulsion is, is built up over time. Uh, we, we, we use the phrase hardness of heart or calloused heart, and it's similar to the way that a callus literally works, like a callus that's on your hand or, or somewhere where maybe you uh, do lots of labor. You are going to develop a callus in that area, and that callus is a way of protecting you. Of you've experienced something that maybe at one time caused your hand to be raw and it was uncomfortable, so your body, in seeking to protect itself, started to layer. And it started to form calluses so that you would no longer feel the thing that once caused you pain. And there's a lot of people in this world who religion in their past has caused them pain. And because of the pain of their past, they are now calloused to religion in their present. And they are going to, the moment that religion or the moment that the Word of God or the moment that truth comes into their life, their body rejects it. Their soul rejects seemingly rejects it because they've built up a hardness of heart. The more that, and, the, and the more that they've rejected the Word of God, the, the more that that callous or that hardness of heart is going to be in their lives. I also think about it this way. Um, I grew up uh, in, in a house that was surrounded by woods and I would, uh, you know, as a kid, that was a dream come true. You loved to go out in the woods and, and to run around. And, and I, I, that was my childhood, I feel like, was going into the woods and just running around. Uh, but in the woods, surrounded by, by woods, there would be these paths that seemingly to a child came out of nowhere, had no idea where these paths came from. Uh, they were deer, uh, most likely deer and other animals. They would all walk the same path. All these different animals in our woods would walk the same path, and it would wear into the ground to where nothing's going to grow into the places that they had been walking, that the path that was underfoot of these animals, that path had been laid barren. And I think about the animals and, and, the, and the animals under their feet laying down a path that is barren and hard, and I read about this passage of, of people whose hearts are, are barren and hard, and they are underfoot as well, underfoot of the evil one. Satan has a control over their life. Satan ha has made it to where they are so comfortable in the world that their lifestyle is so diametrically opposed from the Christian's lifestyle that the two cannot be together. And our temptation oftentimes can be to look at those people and to say, you're the reason for this. You're the cause for this. And to some degree, that is true. But the point is, is we can't view them as the instigators of that. The instigators of their hardness of heart is the evil one. Ephesians phrases it like this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against humans. Our, our war, our spiritual war, is not against other humans. Our spiritual war is against the devil, the evil forces of the devil. And when we encounter someone who does have a hardness of heart to the gospel, uh, we are called not to be evil 
towards the individual, not to be harmful toward the individual, but instead to re reserve those emotions and feelings for the evil one, for the Satan that has these people underfoot. Um, real quickly, as Jesus is talking about these four soils, it, it should be, I, I should have mentioned before, uh, all four soul, soils are redemptive. You might encounter someone who, when, when they first encounter the gospel, that they have a hardness of heart and they instantly reject it. And they might reject the gospel and the good news in their life for years. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they will eternally reject the gospel. There is potential. There's always potential. So what do we do for people that we encounter with a hardness of heart? If it's a loved one that we encounter with a hardness of heart, what do we do? We pray for them first off. Uh, we, we pray. Uh, we ask God to help them, soft, to help soften their heart. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, God is speaking about the nation of Israel, and he says that I will remove their heart of stone, and I will give them a heart of flesh. And it's only God, ultimately, that can truly transform the heart. And we pray for these people that they can encounter God in a way that will transform their heart. Next thing is, if we have people in our lives who have a hardness of heart, we continue to be there for them. Now, there might be some wisdom we need to practice and how it is that we are there for them, but ultimately we need to be there for them because there might be a time in their life where God does indeed humble them where God does bring about some circumstance in their life where they are brought to their knees and their only place to look is up to, up to their Father in heaven. And in that moment, they're going to need people in their lives to bring the good news to them. And they're going to be receptive in that moment. And if because of their past, their hardness of heart in the past, we have completely cut off ties or we have created more uh, barriers between us than we potentially have cut off the good news entering their life again. Ultimately, what Jesus is pointing to here is a response. When the word goes out, there is going to be a variation of responses. One of those responses is going to be a hardness of heart where people instantly turn away the gospel. Uh, the next soil that Jesus talks about is the rocky soil found uh, in verses uh, 5 and 6 in the original parable and then in the retelling in verses 16 and 17. Uh, and in verses 16 and 17, as Jesus is explaining the rocky soil, he says, And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root, uh, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Jesus says that the rocky soil, this represents people who they believe in God, that they, that they come to faith, that they uh, hear the good news of Jesus, and they get really excited, and they get really enthusiastic about it, and they say, well, well I'm all in. But their roots never actually penetrate into the soil. And that this idea of, of I want to be a believer is all on the wrong foundation. And that with this improper foundation, that the moment that persecution or trials comes into their life, that that plant dies. In the parable, he talks about the, the plant has no roots in the actual soil. It's just sort of around the rocks. And when the sun comes out, the plant cannot withstand the sun, and it withers and dies. As he explains the parable, he says, It's those who come to faith quickly, and they put their faith out there boldly uh, but it's not rooted in the right thing and when, when persecution and trials come their faith withers but notice on what Jesus says in verse 17 toward the end when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word isn't that an interesting way that Jesus chooses to talk about their persecution and their tribulation their persecution and tribulation is not necessarily external Probably part of it is, but their tr persecution and tribulation doesn't necessarily come from other individuals. What does it come from? Their relationship with the Word of God. That there are people who say that they believe in Jesus, who say that they believe in God, but they don't do it for the right reasons. And because of that, when the Word of God, when they're actually confronted with the Word of God, they wither in front of it. Here's what James says about it. If you have your Bibles, you want to go to James chapter 1. I'm going to read James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. 
James is talking about the Word of God, the power that the Word of God has, uh, and, and he's talking about people who have some level of belief in the Word of God, but not their full trust and belief in the Word of God. And in James chapter 1, uh, James says this, starting in verse 22. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, as in it's difficult. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James is saying the word of God is a mirror. And we hold that mirror up to us. And if you are standing in front of a mirror and you see a flaw within yourself, you see flaws within yourself that are fixable, what are you going to do? You're going to fix them. As you were getting ready for church this morning, and, and before you walked out the door, you probably stood in front of a mirror, and if you noticed, uh, oh, my hair's not like it normally is, you're, you're going to fix it. Or, oh no, my, my shirt is, is inside out. I put my shirt on inside out. What are you going to do? You're going to take your shirt off, and you're going to put it right side on. If you see a problem, you're, you're going to fix it. James says the Word of God is laid before us. The perfect law of liberty is laid before us, and as it reflects onto us, it shows us the ways that we are not like Christ. It shows us the ways that we are not living to the standard that God has set before us. And just like a mirror points to these things that are obvious to you that you need to change, the Word of God points to us on things in our lives that need to change. And this is essential this is absolutely essential when it comes to our relationship with God. There is no salvation without repentance. There is no salvation without true life change. And that's what the Word of God shows us, that, hey, there has to be some real life change. And I believe for this soil that is the rocky soil, this person who is persecuted and under adversity from the Word of God, that they are people who, who want the blessing of what it means to be saved, but they don't want the one who brings the blessing. And the one who brings the blessing, he brings the blessing of salvation, but the one that brings the blessing also brings his lordship. He also brings a control over our lives that we must submit to. And the one who's in the rocky soil says, I want the salvation without the submission. I want the salvation without the life change. And when they see that a life change is required, they wither under it. I don't want my life to change. I want to live for me. I want to live doing the things that I want to do. But the Word of God says that's, that's not the way of a Christian. It's not the way that we're called to live. We're called to live in humble submission to Jesus because He is the one who brings the blessing. So for the one in the rocky soil, their enthusiastic start has the wrong foundation causing a withering faith experience. Uh, their foundation was self-serving. They got saved because that's what you're supposed to do or that's what they were pressured to do or they believed that was socially right or, or intellectually right. But the moment that they realize change is required, they start to wither and they do not last or endure, much like what James chapter 1 was talking about. Remember what James chapter 1 said. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. Oftentimes, Jesus through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, as it works on our lives, and it shapes us, and it molds us. It is a painful experience to shed self so that we can look like Christ. Oftentimes, that is painful and uncomfortable and something we don't want to go through, but it's something we should talk about more because all of us are going through it, and if we persevere but the one who looks in the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. That blessing is, of course, eternal, but that blessing is here and in the now. As we are people who choose to be shaped by Christ, that is something that blesses us in the now. The third soil, you know, the first two soils, I would say, are things that people within the pew as in, if you are just someone who sits in the pew, uh, not just someone who sits in the pew, but if you are someone who regularly sits in the pew, probably the first two soils we don't have to worry about as much because they're about people who instantly reject or people who very quickly reject. The third soil is a bit trickier. 
The third soil is the thorny soil. And in, and in the uh, initial parable, Jesus says that, that this uh, seed is, is sown in with weeds. And as the weeds and as the uh, plant grow together, the weeds and the thorns eventually choke out the plant to where it doesn't bear any fruit. And Jesus, when he's describing what this means in verses 18 and 19, he says this, And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire, uh, desires for other things enter in and choke the word and proves unfruitful. And the point here that I want to make about the thorny soil, their divided allegiance distracts them from fruitful kingdom living. And like I said, this is the area that I'm probably most alarmed about for people in church. Because there's a real potential for regular church attending members to be thorny soil regularly that to be their sort of their definition of who they are to be people who have a divided allegiance that distracts them from fruitful kingdom living when we get to the good soil really you know what the difference is between the thorny soil and the good soil it's a very minimal difference the difference is fruit and we'll talk about that in a second but there's very little differences the thorny soil, the danger is their divided allegiance. And we are all busy people. And there's nothing inherently wrong with, with maintaining a, a busy lifestyle. But that is something that all of us, most of us, really struggle with. Is our business and our schedules and our family and our work. And the other ways that we divide our allegiances with our money and with trying to maintain certain statuses, with trying to keep up to date on whatever TV shows it is that, that we're watching or whatever ball teams it is that we're pulling for, or being too invested in, in politics or whatever it is that's, that's going on in our culture. These things aren't inherently wrong, but they do bring about the potential to divide our allegiances and distract us. And what happens is, is, is we become people who we are churchgoers, but we're not people who are fruit bearers. We don't have the fruit that comes with what it means to be called a Christian. And the fruit of what it means to be called a Christian, oftentimes our minds jump straight to fruit of the Spirit, and that's true. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. Those things will be in your life if the Spirit of God is in your life. That is fruit of the Spirit. But there's other fruit that as Christians we bear in our lives. And, and you could maybe call church attendance a fruit that is in your life. That is a fruit. It's not the fruit. Um, you could call, you know, regular Bible study in your life. That is a fruit. That is not the fruit. You could call it a regular prayer life. A regular uh, prayer in your life, you could call that a fruit. It's not the fruit. All these things, along with the fruit of the Spirit, make up fruit within our lives. And ultimately, if you want to be a decipherer, if you are someone who lives in the thorny soil, or if you're someone who lives in the good soil, ultimately what it comes down to is the fruit. Do you have fruit in your life? Evidence that points to your faithfulness to God. That's what Jesus says in Verse 20, But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And the thing I want us to remember about the good soil, they understand the word and respond with fruitful kingdom living. They live out the Shema. They live out what it really means to hear, what it really means to have ears that hear. They hear the word of God. The good soil understands the Word of God and how it applies to their life, and they make decisions to build their lives around what it is that they know. They understand, they respond, they bear fruit. We're out of time. 
But if you'll allow me just a minute here to close. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How is it that we work on our ears? How is it that we become people who, who are more willing to understand, to respond, and to bear fruit? How is it? How is it the apostles did it? And I've alluded to this earlier. In Mark chapter 1, verses one and two, or Mark chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the beginning of this story, it says this, And he began to teach beside the sea. So this is before he gave the parables. And he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, and then he gave the parable. So Jesus has a crowd in front of him that's so large that the solution is that he's going to get in the boat and row out a certain distance away so that he could see all along the shoreline and cast his voice out over the waters where it's going to echo to this mass amount of people. It's a very large crowd. Again, he began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him. How is it that we have ears that let us hear? I alluded to it earlier. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. He began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him. Mark chapter 4, verse 10. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve. So this phrase, and when he was alone, is not actually implying that Jesus was by himself. It's implying that the crowd had dispersed. And when he was alone, the, the, when the crowd had dispersed, I mean the very next line is about how he wasn't alone. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve. What does that imply? That the twelve were there, and who else was there? Others. Probably. People who were part of that huge crowd, who heard this parable, and thought, I need to hear more. I need to go to this person and learn more from him. I need to go sit at this person's feet and see what wisdom he, he really has. And when he was there, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you, the secret has been given. To you who chose to stick around, to you who came for further inquiry, to you who wanted to see what I was really about, to you who are here for the purpose of seeing if you want to be my follower or not, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. They didn't have it before when they heard the parable. When did they have it? When they chose to stick around. When they persevered. When they chose to further inquire of Jesus. So how is it that we are people who have ears to hear? Hearing ears are when you keep inquiring. Hearing ears are when the crowd around Jesus thins out and you're still around. When you've, we've persevered to, to hear the message. That's when you've positioned yourself for the secret of the kingdom of God. And the word has been cast before you this morning, and I have no doubt uh, that when it comes to what type of soil are you, most of us within this room are the good soil. Uh, that's the reason that you chose to come to church this morning. You chose to be here because you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and you want to hear his message. Uh, you want to hear from the Word of God. You want to participate in this worship service with God's people, other people who have that same confession that you have. What type of soil are you? I hope you're the good soil. But the question I want to shift to, if you'll allow me to be cheesy to some degree, is not what type of soil are you, but what type of soul are you? What's the condition of your soul? Saved or not saved? In a relationship with God, not in a relationship with God? Seeking God, not seeking God? What's your soul? In relation to who Jesus is, what is your soul? Are you someone who has been invited into knowing the secret of the kingdom of heaven? Have you gone to Jesus for further information? Have you further inquired and, and let him bestow upon you what it means to be his follower? He's offered that invitation for all of us. 
He wants you to come to him. He's given the message out. He wants you to come to him. So this morning we offer the invitation. It's the same invitation that Christ offers, the invitation to follow him. And if there's a way that this church can help you follow him, uh, we want to help you in that journey. Maybe you've never become a Christian. Maybe you've never put your faith and your trust into Jesus. Maybe you've never confessed your belief in him. You've never repented. You've never really changed your life. You've never entered into the waters of baptism. That opportunity is here for you this morning if you want to become a Christian. Or maybe you've done that, but you look at your life and you say, my heart has grown hard, or my faith has been weak, and I've turned away from God. I've rebelled from God. I'm, I'm, I'm living a life that I know he wouldn't have me to live. My soul is not where it needs to be, and I need help. Whatever it is, if you look at your soul and you say it's not the type that it needs to be, it's not where it needs to be, make that change this morning. If there's any way that we can help you, won't you come as we stand?